السلام عليكم مساء الخير عليكم جميعا جود ايفنينج ليديز اند جنتلمان اي ام ذا دين اوف ذا سكول اوف جلوبال افيرز اند بابليك بوليسي ات از ان اونر اند ا بليجر تو ويلكم يو تو يت انذر تحرير دايلوج ويش وي ستارتد اولموست ا ديكاد اجو ناو اند وير وي هولد ايفنتس ديسكاس فيري توبيكال ايشوز ذات ار بوث of interest to academia and to the community as a, as a whole. Uh, this is a particularly interesting one for several reasons. One is the first one of the new scholastic year, so we're starting off with a bang. And secondly, because the topic itself, uh, Libya, uh, are we on a process leading to settlement? And if so, uh, what are the issues, what are the processes? I say this is interesting because, and I, will, I won't jump into the content of the speakers' uh, stories, but I followed Libya when you could only find one voice, and then suddenly where you found too many voices and can't figure out who's actually talking to who. I followed Libya even this summer at the very beginning where we were talking about military conflict, not between the Libyans, that was going on anyway, but, all, but also between regional parties. And now we have so many meetings going around uh, trying to put the pieces together It's a good development, but I'm not sure if we're on track or not, and that will be the main role of uh, our two main participants. Uh, I'm very honored and uh, pleased to have Mohammed Igdairi, uh, the former foreign minister of Libya, a former international civil servant, and uh, uh, somebody who's done uh, very distinguished studies, both uh, well, in, in Europe in particular, but also He's left his mark in uh, the intellectual circles in the Middle East and in the Arab world in particular. Uh, he will speak to us about the topic, and of course, it's up to him to get into uh, the details. And uh, Brahim, uh, who I'll introduce in a second, will give the formal introduction. Uh, having Lisa Anderson, Dr. Lisa Anderson, join us is always a personal pleasure and, and an honor. Uh, I won't waste your time with my stories with Lisa, but she knows the, uh, that I've always been impressed by her intellectual input uh, and productivity. But on Libya and North Africa in particular, she's particularly well versed. Uh, she knows the subject very well. She knows the characters uh, and her insight, her commentary on what Mohammed's going to say, I think will really add uh, a lot of dessert to the, uh, uh, to, to, to the main dish that we're having here. Uh, my distinguished colleague, uh, Ibrahim Awad, is a uh, professor of global affairs at, at the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. He's also the director of the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies. Uh, and he is somebody who is truly committed to this engagement uh, between the community and academia. So he's always been very enthusiastic about helping out with the Tahrir uh, dialogue. Ibrahim is the boss. Uh, for this topic. Uh, I can still interrupt, but I mean, essentially he's the boss. Uh, he will introduce the, the speakers formally and manage us as, as we talk. Uh, Ibrahim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Nabil. Thank you so much for your introduction. You have already introduced me, so I will not uh, waste time in saying that I'm a professor, Ibrahim Awa, professor of practice. Um, in Global Affairs and Director of the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies. And I'd like uh, in particular to, uh, to welcome the audience um, in this Tahir Dialogue number 89. This is the 89th Tahir Dialogue that, um, that uh, we hold. I'm also uh, especially delighted to welcome alongside the audience uh, to welcome our speaker and our discussant. Uh, they are really distinguished, they are highly respected, and they also happen to be uh, good and dear friends. Uh, I'm welcoming uh, Mohammed Dairi and Lisa Anderson, who will be respectively the speaker and the discussion. I would say a few words about each in a few minutes. Uh, let me just uh, try to introduce in very few words the subject of uh, this Tahrir Dialogue. Peace, stability, and security are required everywhere in all countries for the sake 
and interests of their own peoples, the peoples of these countries. For the interests of Libyans first, peace, stability, and security are imperative. But Libya is also of great importance to its neighbors, to the East Egypt, to the West Tunisia and Algeria, to the South Niger, Chad, uh, and Sudan, uh, and to the North, the Mediterranean, and Europe uh, beyond it. A stable Libya is a source of oil of the best quality, and a large labor market for its bordering and neighboring countries and beyond. However, Libya in the last decade has been an enormous source of weapons that have flooded the Sahel and the Sahara and countries to the east and west. It has also been a playground for extremists and terrorists. Europe saw its territory as a transit for migrants that Europe does not want to receive. Two governments were formed in Libya in the East and West. Militias multiplied and military battles raged. Regional and international powers interfered with and intervened in Libyan affairs. The United Nations in Libya was unable to make any practical and effective progress in normalizing the country. For all practical purposes, Libya became a failed state. But what prompted GAP to organize the Tahrir Dialogue, this Tahrir Dialogue, are the glimpses of hope that may be announcing that Libya is finally close to the end of the tunnel. In the last two months, several processes suddenly became active, from Bosniga in Morocco, to Montreux in Switzerland, to Berlin in Germany, to Hurghada and Cairo here in Egypt, Libyan parties got together and discussed power consolidation, the unification of governing structures, and the question of weapons and the military more generally. This is the subject of our Tahir dialogue and about these processes and the issues they discuss, we have, as you already said, uh, Muhammad Dairi, uh, the speaker, who will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, followed by Lisa Anderson, the discussant, for about ten, 8 to 10 minutes. Dean Fahmy will then make a few comments, after which I will address some questions to the speaker and the discussant. The audience is welcome to address questions to the speaker and discussant using the chat function at the bottom of your screens. The questions will be relayed to the speaker and discussant. Before giving the floor to Muhammad Dairi, let me very succinctly introduce him as well as Lisa Anderson and Nabil Fahmi. Muhammad Dairi is uh, the former foreign minister of the interim Libyan government. He was foreign minister from 2014 to 2019. He studied in France at the University of Grenoble, where um, he had his first and his master's degree in law. He was a diplomat. He worked for the League of Arab States in the mission of the League to the United Nations and specialized agencies in Geneva. And he was a senior official of the United Nations system, specifically of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. And his last position was country representative to Egypt. Here in Egypt was the last position Mohammed Dari held at the United Nations system. Lisa Anderson does not need to be introduced. However, let me say also a few words. She is a special lecturer and a professor of international relations emerita at the Columbia University's School of International and Public Affairs. She had been dean of that school of SIPA for 10 years, from 1997 to 2007. In between, she was provost of the American University in Cairo from 2008 to 2011, and then the president of our university from 2011 to 2016. 
The scholarly research uh, of Lisa encompasses state formation in the Middle East and North Africa. She is one of the uh, world's utmost experts on Libya, as well as on Tunisia. And one of her books is The State and Social Transformation in Tunisia and Libya between 1830 and 1980. Uh, Nabil Fahmi is the founding dean of the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the American University in Cairo. He's distinguished university professor of practice in international diplomacy. He has a long career in Egyptian uh, diplomacy crowned by his occupying the position of foreign minister uh, in 2013 and 2014, before which, before retiring from the diplomatic uh, service, he had been ambassador of Egypt to Japan an ambassador of Egypt to the United States for nine years from 1999 to 2008. Without further ado, I think I will ask Mohammed Dairi to uh, speak to us about these processes um, uh, and about the issues that, that they discuss. Mohammed, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, uh, at first, I would like to extend my warm thanks to Dr. Nabil Fahmi, uh, the Dean of the Public Affairs School at the AUC, whom I knew, as you know, Ibrahim, uh, since 2011, when we had together a survey on Syrian refugees. Since I grew to know him better as a, a dear intellectual, uh, in addition to his former public office as Minister for Foreign Affairs, we have been enriched by Dr. Nabil Fahmi contributions in Arab media and international fora that he has been invited to. Uh, I am thrilled uh, here today to be with uh, Lisa Anderson because I knew Dr. Uh, Anderson as provost and as uh, uh, president of the AUC, but especially as uh, a prominent figure in Libyan affairs. He has been uh, um, known as uh, uh, an astute no, no, uh, person who know Libya and the intricacies of the uh, Libya uh, issue since 2011. Let me start by saying that it goes without saying that Libya has been plagued by war and destruction. This is well known and adequately put in the media limelights. However, there is a little knowledge of what Libyans have increasingly been frustrated with. In reality, they endure nowadays deteriorating living conditions, as shown by shortages of cash, power, and fuel. Throughout the country, Libyans are facing armed groups whose behavior often goes unchecked, as well as an increasingly worsening uh, coronavirus epidemic. More importantly, there is a war fatigue across the regions in Libya, but Libyans grew recently angry at an outrageous level of corruption, which is rife in Western and Eastern Libya alike. Libyans took to the streets and demonstrated their opposition to the current state of, up, of public affairs in the country. In the face of this very gloomy situation, as mentioned by Ibrahim, there has been a dose of optimism within the international circles. The German Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Maas, was cautious Monday at the ministerial meeting of the Berlin process, when he stated that he was prudently optimistic. In this connection, there have been a few processes as mentioned by Ibrahim, with a view to bringing about a settlement in our war-torn country. Let us have a quick glance at these multiple processes alongside the real issues and challenges that come with them. What are these processes? Since the beginning of September, the Moroccan government has hosted uh, talks in Abu Zneika between two delegations, representing the House of Representatives and the High State Council. The discussions have revolved around criteria of selecting the candidates for positions relating to key and sovereign institutions, such as the Central Bank, the, the Supreme Court, 
etc. This track is due to resume soon after the conclusion of an agreement last night in Morocco on the criteria for filling these positions. At the same time, another track allowed the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue in Geneva to, orga to organize indeed in Montreux a brainstorming exercise between representative of key individuals, groups, and entities in Libya. The outcome resulted in a roadmap for a fifth and hopefully the last since 2011. The outcome resulted in a roadmap for a fifth transitional period over 18 months after the designation of a presidency council that secures the equal representation of the traditional three Libyan provinces. On 27, 27 uh, 28 September, the Egyptian government allowed two delegations from the GNA, the Government of National Accord in Tripoli, and the LNA in the East to meet and discuss in Horgada uh, military matters. The meeting adopted interesting and positive recommendations. The fact that GNA and the LNA, the Libyan National Army and the Government of National Accord, military officers discussed ways to jointly secure CIRT implement the removal of mercenaries and militia, as well as their possible unification, have constituted progress towards striking a comprehensive solution to the conflict in Libya. In all of these fora, ANSMIL, the UN mission, has been present so as to ensure that all are consistent with a UN-led process. However, UNSMIL is expected to be in the driving seat in, the, in convening this month a Libyan political dialogue forum that could build on the aforementioned intra-Libyan talks and usher in an understanding for a new presidency, council, and the national unity government. However, all of, uh, there are critical issues and challenges that lie ahead. Firstly, the political dialogue forum may suffer from a tight deadline set by the resignation of the Government of National Accord Prime Minister, Mr. Siraj, at the end of October. The forum may be led to hastily form a presidency council and a government that would lack a real buy-in from the main stakeholders. It's not certain that even the forum would meet as envisaged by mid-October. Mrs. Uh, Williams has uh, declared a couple of days ago that it may be convened at the end of the month. It's therefore wise to avoid a solution for political expedi expediency that may eventually prove counterproductive. Corollary, corollary, corollary to this time, to this tight timeline, a real challenge has recently arisen, which relates to inclusivity, a cornerstone for any settlement. There have been attempts to sideline important parties to the strife that has marred the overall political and security situation in the country. Once again, we shouldn't fall into the trap, into the same trap of 2015, when Article 8 was then designed to exclude the LNA general commander. The end result gave unfortunately rise to multiple institutions to government, one in the East and one in the, in the West, to central uh, banks, and even a recent breakaway House of Representatives in Tripoli that have sharply fragmented the country. We often hear from foreign diplomats and officials an overdue, an overused, sorry, phrase, Libyan should be able to agree and settle their problems. Let us therefore listen to Libyans like the Government of National Accord Minister of Interior, Mr. Fathi Bashaga, who stated a few days ago that he stood ready to negotiate even with Mr. Khalifa Haftar. In negotiating, set, in negotiating settings, there is no room for love and hatred. You on, engage those who have leverage at the political and security areas and make sure that they don't spoil the framework you seek to push forward. Equally important for the international community is to craft out an agreement and ensure later its effective implementation, 
I repeat and ensure later its effective implementation. That shouldn't be confined, an agreement, that shouldn't be confined to a power sharing package as it was the case in 2015, but rather a solid comprehensive framework that addresses Libya core issues. The agreement should aim at rebuilding institutions, introducing economic reforms, and paving the way for a new constitution that would allow for holding presidential and parliamentary elections at the close of the planned fifth transitional period. Furthermore, the prospects of a permanent ceasefire continue to look uncertain, despite the statements of 23rd of August of this year from Mr. Siraj and Mr. Aguila Saleh. The five plus five military track needs to be convened in order to finalize and strengthen the last week talks at Horgada. But the country urgently requires the implementation of an effective DDR, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, targeting current militia leaders and members. The design and the implementation of a security sector reform should absolutely follow. In 2015, the LPA, in the LPA, there was an article, Article 34, and a security annex on the DDR, but nothing, unfortunately, was implemented. Of course, there is no military solution in Libya. The crisis out there is, never, is nevertheless not only of a political and economic nature, but we have got to acknowledge that security too has been one of the most, one of the root causes, one of the, the drivers of the conflict. Last but not least, it remains to be seen whether there is a real consens consensus within the international community to foster an agreed upon solution in Libya. Libya is a regional and an international issue that cannot be solved only by Libyans. And in spite of public made, uh, statements in bilateral and multilateral gatherings, not all external stakeholders are on the same wavelength when it comes to stabilizing our country. We are yet to witness a consensus on the new UN Special Envoy, a, a position that has been and filled since last March. Overall, a much more vigorous approach and diplomatic action are badly needed to, ap to appease and hence bringing into the peace and security fold all of those who have been involved in the Libya crisis. Thank you, Brahim. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed, for uh, this clear, uh, clear statement and uh, um, you, you, you pointed out the issues uh, at stake, and there are many issues, uh, the threats uh, that uh, still loom. Um, you, were, you, were, you were realistic. Uh, I, I sensed uh, hope in your uh, statement, but I also sensed uh, uh, some uh, misgivings. Um, you, you, you think there still are some threats uh, that should be handled um, uh, skillfully by different uh, actors. I'll get back to one point uh, that, uh, that you mentioned, which uh, struck my attention. But for the moment, for the moment, I think the best uh, uh, commentator on what you have just said is Lisa Anderson. So we will listen to Lisa. What, what do you think, Lisa? What, what Mohammed said and more generally. Well, thank you very much. And I want to reiterate uh, Mohammed's thanks to uh, the Dean and to you, Ibrahim, for hosting this um, event. Um, I do think it's a, it's a propitious time to be thinking about Libya more broadly. Um, in some ways, as Mohammed has outlined, there are there's more action on the diplomatic front, if you will, um, than there has been in a long time, and, and that's presumably promising. So I don't want to gainsay the extent to which um, we ought to be following and supporting those various efforts. That said, I think I'm probably not uh, as optimistic, and I don't mean to suggest that 
any of us are particularly optimistic, but I don't think, I think we've had, and unfortunately, the more we have these kinds of diplomatic efforts that fail, um, the more likely subsequent diplomatic efforts are to fail. I think there's not only a growing fatigue within Libya, um, I think that's important. I think living conditions have deteriorated. I think the exhaustion with the lack of law and order um, is increasing. I think the virus is only exacerbating that. So I think that's clearly the case. Um, but I think there's also a, a profound skepticism, almost cynicism about the efforts over the last um, nine years or so to actually bring um, people together. It hasn't really worked very well. And so I think people are you know, almost afraid to be hopeful. Um, and that's not a good place to start. On the other hand, as I think the Dean probably has said to me repeatedly, you don't negotiate with your friends, you negotiate with your adversaries. And so the fact that adversaries are actually talking to each other is probably a little glimmer of hope that we ought to um, hold on to. Um, I'm I, I, I think the accent um, on the importance of Libyan actors um, talking to each other in Mohammed's overview is correct. Um, I think this is a problem that only Libyans are gonna be able to solve at the end of the day. Um, and I think in that sense, there's a kind of exhaustion with uh, game playing and failing to solve these problems that everyone has seen for so long. But I wanna emphasize something that he ended with that I think we all ought to perhaps take a little bit more seriously. Ibrahim, in your introduction to this, you talked about arms flowing out of Libya into the Sahel and in fact, into Southern Egypt, which certainly in the early days of the conflict was the case. But unfortunately, arms have been flowing into Libya for a long time and in huge debilitating uh, quantities. And there are, for every single militia, there is an external patron. Um, it's gotten impossible to follow the, you know, um, dance card of who is supporting who at any given moment, but the um, extent to which Libya has been treated as a playground for particularly regional but also international players has become um, obvious and I think makes it very difficult for Libyans to actually sit together and discuss um, their differences and the solutions to their problems. So I guess I'd like to think a little bit together um, about what the regional, what changes in the regional context will be propitious for Libya. Um, I do think the, you know, sort of basic cleavage, but you know, what you're seeing in some ways, and you have seen now for some years, the cleavage in the Gulf is being played out in Libya, um, despite the fact that, you know, neither of the parties to the Gulf conflict have much interest in Libya, in fact. Um, are there prospects for a kind of regional detente that would help um, bring people together in Libya? And would a roadmap in Libya actually be auspicious for a regional detente. I mean, I think the two things could be connected, um, but I certainly cannot imagine Libyans being able to solve all of their problems by themselves, even if they're being brought together by international um, actors of various kinds, if they continue to be egged on by international. So the, so the, the, Many of the Libyan groups, you know, sometimes we call them proxies. Um, and I suppose in some ways that's true, although it doesn't take into account how much agency the Libyans themselves have here. 
But I do worry that because people don't really have much skin in the game, they're using this as a way to needle each other independent of any interest they may have in Libya. And I include the Emirates, I'm Egypt sometimes, Turkey obviously, increasingly beyond the region, the Russians, the French. Everybody's, you know, sort of trying to play out an interest they have in their status in the region, um, independent of what happens in Libya. This is damaging to Libya, obviously, but it also makes it hard for the Libyans to sit down um, with each other, knowing that there are people looking over their shoulder. So I wonder whether we could perhaps talk a little bit about whether the prospects for um, ramping that down are um, likely to be better in the near future. And let me end then in um, what's clearly, a, you know, I'm sitting in the United States right now, clearly an unknown, but um, I do think that if there's a change in American administration, there will be a change in American policy in the region in a way that may actually um, contribute to uh, um, an effort to ramp down some of the, at this point, almost um, a free-for-all of involvement in Libya. So one can imagine if there is an agreement for an 18-month roadmap or something like that, that there would be both international and regional changes that would be helpful in getting that roadmap actually implemented. Um, but I, you know, as everyone knows, I think um, this is, and no one disputes, this has been enormously damaging to a country that could be a very fruitful and constructive um, player in the region. And I would like to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for uh, this uh, light that you have shed on the on 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 situation in Libya and the complexity of of this situation, the extension between between internal um, actors, uh, regional and international actors, all on a continuum. Thank you so much. I think uh, all um, these. Um, um, all this assessment uh, will be a matter of, of discussion in a few minutes. And now let me ask uh, Nabil Fahmi to please intervene with the comments he might have. Uh, thank you both. This was, this was really great. Mohammed, you laid out the landscape of activities and what's being done or attempted to be done in different areas. And Lisa added sort of the political context of uh, what can and what cannot be done. I have to say, I'm a bit perplexed. Uh, beginning of the year, I wrote an article basically saying that the potentially first outbreak of, outbreak of violence regionally uh, would be in Libya. And I'm literally talking about the potential violence between Turkey and Egypt in particular, if there was an increased threat to Egypt. And a few weeks later, the president laid down a red line. Uh, you laid out, Mohammed, a structure for negotiations that is very complex, but in all honesty, if I put together all of my educational and uh, diplomatic experience, it would have come up with a structure very similar to that. These parts are the same parts one would have had to think about. Local stakeholders, security, this, this, and that, and uh, smuggling, of course, both ways and all of that. What perplexes me is that why this sudden change? Because Lisa's correct in saying, unless the international community gets its act in order in looking at Libya, uh, this is not going to end up logically in a positive sense. So I'm curious, the question to both of you, is this change in posture simply a function of exhaustion by the parties internationally and regionally, uh, as well as those locally? Uh, or is there something else? I find the uh, announced resignation uh, of Mr. Sirag rather odd, uh, both in the Libyan context, but also in terms of uh, what is behind it or, or not behind it. And I would 
add a final point. I completely agree that unless regional players and international players look at their, uh, evaluate the situation differently, I don't think we can get very far because as much as Libyans may want to move forward or try, uh, they all depend on a lot of outside support. So to cut my comments short, really, let me say the following. Uh, Mohammed is the influence of the locals enough to make some sense or make the non-locals a bit more logical and a bit more uh, rational? Can the local hands actually have more influence on the decision making than the regional or international hands? And secondly, to Lisa, if I may, as difficult as I see this in the short term, I don't, re I don't really see potential progress for many of these regional issues without some sort of understanding between Turkey and Egypt, or for that matter, uh, detente between Turkey and Egypt. And I don't see the detente in the short term. Uh, much more than the role of the big powers, per se, uh, for the following reason. One, I find the silliness of the big powers that they can't approve a UN envoy because of their differences. I mean, I've never seen anything as petty uh, as that. And secondly, because it doesn't seem that any of the big powers want to really put in, invest in this process to make it succeed. They don't want to lose, but I'm not really sure they want to invest enough in it. So I'm just raising these questions with you because in all honesty, I'm perplexed. Uh, would love to be proven uh, wrong and that there's more reason for optimism. But if you, if you can give me clarity, Mohammed and Lisa, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Nabil. Would, um, would uh, Mohammed and Lisa like to react uh, uh, briefly to what uh, Nabil had just said? Yes, um, uh, Brahim, uh, Dr. Nabil has uh, uh, put across a question on the uh, value that we can impute to the Libyan public opinion, to the domestic uh, actors, uh, when it comes to bringing about a settlement in Libya. Let me uh, say that, uh, indeed, Mr. Siraj uh, had, uh, had not tendered his resignation, but he uh, mentioned that he would be ready to leave by the end of October. However, uh, before him, the Prime Minister of the East, the interim government, Abdullah Sini, had already announced his resignation. And he said that he would be a care, rather a caretaker. Th these uh, two uh, events, uh, follow demonstrations uh, as of the 23rd of August in Tripoli and in the East. People, as I said, are exhausted with war, but also with, uh, uh, which, with what has been uh, uh, publicly uh, said uh, and uh, reported about uh, uh, yeah, very, very ugly uh, uh, corruption at the level of the Lib Libyan government in the East and at the level of the GNA in Tripoli. People uh, live without power. There have been power cuts in Tripoli for 14, 18, 20 hours. And the same thing happens in the, in the East. So indeed, there is that, that pressure. However, I must say that within the uh, key stakeholders in Libya, be it in the West or in the East, there are some radicals who are pushing for some military solution as we speak. Indeed, there, uh, there are temptations from some who have uh, lost or others who would like to uh, gain more uh, 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 posture and ground uh, at the political and the security levels in, uh, in Libya. So indeed, we, we have those, uh, those elements that can uh, uh, push external uh, stakeholders, uh, regional powers uh, to uh, uh, and international powers who have been involved with the Libyan issue to uh, uh, go about, uh, to go to, to a, a military track, a military uh, uh, avenue that is, um, uh, is unwelcomed by uh, 
by the, the, the overwhelming majority of Libyans. Thank you, thank you. Mohammed Liza, would you like to react? Yeah, I, first of all, let me just um, agree. I think the, the problem is not sort of on the ground public opinion. People are exhausted, sick and tired of this. They don't see any clear winner um, under the current circumstances. Um, but the problem really is that there are, you know, political opportunists always and everywhere. And there are people who want to protect their corrupt interests in various of the status quo. So you do have people who stand to lose by any kind of agreement, and they are going to be troublemakers no matter what. Um, so I think, I do think that there's an opportunity here for what you might call the responsible Libyan elite um, to really you know, sort of make some compromises and begin to think about how to get themselves out of this quagmire that they're in. Um, and so you hope that, you know, simply getting people together in Urgado or Geneva or wherever actually contributes to that. Um, so I'm not completely um, pessimistic about this, but I do think the problem really is that there are now entrenched interests in um, violence and corruption that are hard to, to uh, root out. Um, I agree about the big powers. The big powers are clearly Libya doesn't matter to anyone and it's just a place you can posture. And I think that is um, unbelievably irresponsible. Um, I do think that the American government um, is aiding and abetting that at this point, um, as much by omission as anything they're actually doing, but it does mean that it's hard to imagine the French and the Russians behaving any differently than they are now, unless the Americans behave differently. Um, so that, I think, you know, again, we have an election, we'll see what the outcome of that will be, there may be a different American posture, in which case people might begin to behave a little bit differently at the international level. Um, I, you know, I think that you're right about Turkey and Egypt. I think just as the Emirates and the Qataris need to figure out how to resolve some of their differences, Turkey and Egypt need to figure out how to resolve some of their differences. And I think that's both of those are quite deeply held divisions at this point that are going to be hard to resolve. Um, it would be nice and conceivable, it seems to me, that Libya be treated as a place to experiment with that. So you can have lots of differences, but you can say, let's see what happens if we agree to disagree calmly on Libya, for example. Egypt and Turkey, it's conceivable to me that that could happen. And that would be a place where you begin to test out whether a kind of detente would be possible. That's about as optimistic as I can get on that front, but it would certainly be worth exploring. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, let me, let me uh, raise two questions. Uh, I'll pose two questions to, to, to each, two to Mohammed and, and two to, to Lisa. My first question to Mohammed relates to something that he has said that may seem obvious, but as a statement, I think it's quite important. Mohammed Daly said that Libya is a regional and international issue that cannot be left to Libyans to solve alone. I personally agree with what he said, but this does mean, in fact, that it's not only Libya. All issues, all questions now, as you can see, uh, have extensions from the subnational to the national, to the regional, to the international. I think the importance of Muhammad's statement is that he sort of legitimizes, legitimizes processes where all these actors would sit and try to work out a settlement together. I'm not saying that this is wrong, but I'm saying that this is something that should probably be discussed. My second 
uh, question or issue I raised with Muhammad is about all this importance given to agreeing on distribution of positions, what are called uh, regal positions, uh, uh, frankly, you agree on positions, but you need to agree on the processes that will follow for the people who will be appointed. Uh, because you agree on, on people who occupy positions and then you don't agree on how they will, they will proceed and this would be a great, uh, a great failure afterwards. So I would like to know how you think about this. To Lisa, I have two, two questions. A few years ago, Lisa, I listened to you say something which to me is of great importance and I, I keep using it um, and, and attributing it to you. That geography is extremely important in Libya. That the, the, this vast country, huge country, and sparsely populated makes issues difficult. How does this, how does the geographic and demographic factors affect uh, uh, settlement processes and the prospects of process? My second question to you is that you said that the US is not really interested in Libya. But don't you think that the US is interested in checking Russian, Russian influence and importance in Libya? Isn't this probably one of the reasons Nabil was, was, was trying to understand, I am trying to understand why all this sudden, sudden uh, uh, flourishing of processes. It doesn't this have to do with, uh, with the position that Russia is, has been occupying or Turkey? So I, I leave these two questions to you and if you wish to. to Can I just add one question? Yeah, go ahead, maybe. Mohammed and Lisa, if you were speaking to the regional powers today, what would you ask them to do to help the process forward? Thank you. Uh, I would like to answer uh, your two questions, uh, Ibrahim. Uh, the first one uh, on the legitimization of uh, the regional and international powers in the decision making in Libya. Uh, I would say that whether we like it or not, it's a fact of life uh, acknowledged uh, by Libyans themselves uh, from those who are uh, stakeholders on the political and the security scene, but also from us Libyans who uh, are uh, daily following up what's happening in our uh, war-ravaged country. Um, so uh, the, the, there is, uh, I think, a, a margin of maneuver for uh, domestic stakeholders. And the discussions that have uh, taken place in uh, uh, Bosnia and those who may take place hopefully uh, in October in Geneva or in Tunisia because the, the political forum uh, may be uh, shifted to Tunis, uh, to Tunisia. Uh, I would say that even there, uh, we have uh, some uh, margin of maneuver for, for uh, uh, our national stakeholders. However, uh, if we were to have some uh, success uh, at the end of those uh, uh, discussions, uh, it would be too uh, thanks to the regional and international pressure. Uh, regional and international pressure uh, are playing a great role in the decision making when it comes to Libya. Uh, whether uh, I think it's uh, uh, morally and politically acceptable to Libyans and to other uh, uh, people who love Libya. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, we are left with this uh, uh, bitter reality. On the uh, other hand, on the uh, people and the selection of people, uh, Ibrahim, and not uh, um, embarking on discussing the real issues that uh, uh, Libya is grappling with, Indeed, uh, I would like to paraphrase late uh, uh, Mahmoud Jibril, our former prime minister, who said that uh, since 2011, what matters to Libyans are the, uh, the key positions, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the government structures that have to be put in place with uh, names attached to them, rather the uh, project for our uh, society, for our country. Uh, so indeed, uh, uh, we lack, as we speak, uh, across the board, uh, some uh, credible uh, and trustworthy uh, projects for Libya uh, that uh, can be uh, moved forward. Um, on Dr. Nabil's questions about uh, what, are, uh, what is our advice 
and my advice to regional powers indeed is uh, really to uh, have a sort of detent as uh, Lisa mentioned uh, the regional uh, powers can can do that uh, bilaterally but uh, they can also resort to the US or Russia to to uh, to get that done uh, um, on the international issue I would like to just to emphasize that so far we have to spot the leader the international community is like Libyans is fragmented we don't have a leader uh, among the uh, among the stakeholders in the, within the international community who says i am the out there and i am leading the process to bring about uh, 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 a settlement a political and security settlement in libya uh, there have been some attempts in the past uh, by italy france and recently by germany but uh, and indeed uh, uh, I have to uh, state that the U.S. Uh, in the last few months uh, have, uh, has shown interest, increased interest and involvement within the Libyan issue. We have seen on the 21st of June a statement from the National, uh, Se uh, National Security uh, in the U.S. National Security Council in the U.S. Uh, and we had also Mr. Uh, uh, O'Brien, Mr. Robert O'Brien's statement on the 4th of August. Uh, David Schenecker, the Assistant Secretary of State, said last month that he and uh, Secretary Pompeo spent uh, time on Libya and they have been in touch with the, their counterparts in the UK and France. So indeed there has been that interest, but we look forward to an increased involvement from the US diplomacy uh, in the future uh, after the uh, presidential elections. Thank you, Mohammed. Lisa? Yeah, I'll start at the end, actually. There is an irony in any of us thinking that the United States should be called in to solve these problems. Um, that said, um, the outsiders have clearly been very mischievous, so let's see whether they can be constructive. Um, and I think that's really um, perhaps the way to begin to think about this. Um, in and, you know, again, that's what I would be saying were I to be giving any advice to regional powers as well. Um, this is an opportunity to see whether you can be constructive here, get a lot of, I think, credit for that, and probably in a certain way more influence in the long run um, if you experiment with some detente uh, in Libya. So I think there are, you know, you would like to say the outsiders should stay outside, but under the circumstances, since they're already involved, why don't they be involved constructively? Um, and I think you're right, Ibrahim, the United States is a little interested in Libya because of Russia, but that's part of my concern is that it's not really interest in Libya. Libya is still a sort of playing ground in a field for you know, conflicts that are taking place elsewhere and are about something else. And I would like to see people begin to see Libya as actually a place of its own that could be useful in the world of its own, not simply as a, um, an arena for conflicts that are someone else's conflicts. And I think, as I say, I think that's possible. I think people can begin to say, if we think our conflicts have sort of gotten too substantial. We really want to see if there are places where we can tamp this down, so forth and so on. Libya is a good um, opportunity to try that. So perhaps some of these um, initiatives reflect that. We can certainly hope for that. Um, on geography, I mean, you know, I, as we all know, Libya is, you know, three principal regions, two um, important um, East-West division, uh, clearly historically important. Um, the old line always used to be that the Couscous line um, went right straight through Sirt. And, you know, on the West, people eat couscous. On the East, they eat Egyptian food. I think that's not entirely true. But, I mean, the thing that I think is important to recognize about anywhere, but um, Libya is a, an example of this, is that there's been a lot of mobility in Libya. Um, you know, people who come from a particular town 
have had children and who have grown up in other parts of the country for generations now. So that there are sentimental attachments to parts of the country that people continue to hold and should, and there isn't anything wrong with that. But this sense that the you know, different parts of Libya, vast as it is, don't really know each other, um, certainly wasn't true before the um, conflict. I think conflict has had something of a sorting effect, which is too bad because um, you know, needing to knit that back together again is, is going to be a little bit part of the reconstruction of the country. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't overstate the divisions in the country um, you know, any more than I would say that the American Civil War obviously continues to have some resonance in the United States, but uh, after 150 years, I think we can probably put that to bed. And similarly, I think in Libya, there's resonance in some of the regional competition of the last hundred years. But, you know, in the latter part of the 20th century, people moved around in the country quite a lot. Um, and I think that had, that had a salutary effect in beginning to build a common national identity, which you continue to see. People don't want, um, this isn't Yugoslavia. It's not going to come apart that way, as it turns out. Uh, I was saying this is a very salutary comment that, that said and very positive comment, which uh, in itself uh, uh, holds uh, an, 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 an element of um, that, 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 could be, that could be a foundation, in fact, for all the efforts that are uh, exerted um, for, uh, for reaching uh, a settlement. So the, 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 the foundations are solid. Uh, Foundation are solid, uh, and, and I would like to know what Muhammad uh, would like to say about this. Uh, Muhammad, would you like to comment on this uh, very point? And this would be the last, uh, the last uh, intervention in, in our webinar because it's already six o'clock. Muhammad, thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, I would like just to uh, echo what uh, Lisa has said about. Uh, the unity of the, the country, because uh, throughout the years, uh, we have had uh, mixed marriages and we have had indeed uh, some uh, uh, population movements, uh, east, west, south and north. So uh, from that perspective, we have uh, some cements for uh, our national unity, indeed. However, I must say with, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, dismay, that uh, the recent developments since 2014 have uh, created some cracks within Libya itself because uh, our brothers and sisters in Eastern and Southern Libya have uh, thought rightly that uh, they have been marginalized and uh, the, the uh, oil dividends and the oil proceeds have gone to Western Libya. Uh, so th there is that uh, uh, strive for uh, a federalist uh, a state, uh, which has been also corroborated by some movements now in southern Libya and in uh, western Libya too, after what happened in the last year uh, as a result of the offensive on Tripoli. So uh, uh, indeed, Libya needs to uh, look at decentralizing its uh, administrative and political system indeed, uh, maybe through a federal state uh, or uh, uh, through uh, an enlarged decentralization. Uh, however, uh, Libyans in the West, in the East, and in the South would like to see still a united uh, Libya rather than having uh, uh, a split that has been mentioned and uh, talked about in some fora uh, th from some diplomatic and even media, media circles. Indeed, Libya wouldn't be a split. There is a thirst for unity and for uh, the end of the conflict that has uh, plagued our country for the last uh, uh, nine years. Thank you, Mohammed. I think that uh, successful and interesting Tahrir dialogues uh, open the way for other dialogues. They never end. They, they do not close subjects. Uh, they raise more subjects than they discuss uh, and uh, more than they find solutions to the subject. This is, I think, one sign of an interesting uh, uh, seminar, webinar, or any sort of discussion. I think uh, 
um, now after one hour, we have more issues to, to, to be discussed. And I think that we need to discuss them. We are in a region uh, for which uh, Libya is of great importance for many reasons. Um, I hope that uh, in a few months we'll have uh, more positive news. Uh, maybe we will have other issues to discuss, among which those that um, have been raised at the end of this one hour uh, webinar. Uh, thank you very much to the speaker and to the discussion. Thank you very much to the audience. Let me ask uh, Nabil Fahmi, the Dean of the school, whether he would like to add um, anything uh, before we close. No, just again, thank you all for being here. You've honored us by your presence. A promise to the audience, because I know I get this complaint frequently and I see it on the chat. Uh, they always complain that we don't give them enough time to ask questions. So in the future, we will try to schedule 90 minutes to give the speakers and the discussants enough time to have, give you some real insight at the same time to have 20 to 25 minutes at the end for uh, the audience. Uh, they've been uh, in good numbers and I see that they're also interested in asking questions. So the promise goes out there. Don't blame Ibrahim. It's my responsibility. I'll try to arrange that for you. Thank you. All. But, but be sure that after 90 minutes, you'll have more issues raised. So we need another, another, another webinar, all the same. <laughs> the longer you have the webinar, the more issues are raised. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Thank you very much, Mohammed Dairi. Thank you, Nabil. And thank you, uh, uh, particular thanks to, to, to the audience that have remained for the whole hour uh, with us for one hour and five minutes, in fact. Thank you all, and we'll see you again in next Tahir Dialogue, which will be the 90th. Uh, next. Next time that I would be. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Nabil and Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening and good afternoon to you, Lisa. Bye bye.